If you're following along in Brother Layton's book about the journey to hope, you can, here's the book. Let me, I need to hit a button here. Go to the next fancy slide. Did all the slides? Oh, it's just this same old slide. Y'all missed it last week. Just the one slide last week that you missed. Uh, yeah, but if you're, if you're in Brother Layton's book, uh, chapter 13, in your dog-eared copy, and the title of the chapter is From Feeble to Free. <clears throat> At the risk of running into the same problem I had last week, where I relayed a story from Dave's book, and I put it in the wrong context, put it in the wrong state. Uh, uh, I'm going to relate a story from his book again this week, but this one I know for sure is familiar to many of you because it's a story about Jay Holland, who is with us this morning from his hospital bed if technology is working like it should. As Jay grew into young adulthood, he was good-looking, strong as an ox with a charming personality, great physical health, and full of the joy of life. He was an avid hunter, an avid sportsman, um, he was very popular with a crowd of friends and acquaintances. Like many of us in our youth, his focus in his youth wasn't completely on the world of religion and spirituality. And like many of us in our youth, he seemed to approach life with an unintentional sense of invincibility. But then Jay's life changed in an instant. In a split-second car accident, Jay was severely injured. He was left paralyzed with traumatic brain injury and other injuries. Doctors said that he had little hope for a full recovery or any chance of what we would consider a normal life. And although Jay survived the accident, he was left with speech problems and permanent physical paralysis. However, what was truly significant about Jay's situation was that his spirit wasn't paralyzed. As he received treatments for his injuries and slowly regained what little bits of normal life that he could, Jay developed a deep love for Jesus and an appreciation that his life had been spared. And Jay's love for Jesus and his appreciation for life continues to this very day, even as he continues to suffer physically. So I've talked before about the significant emotional event that can shock us out of our ruts. It might take a tragedy or a seemingly hopeless situation to reveal to us that there is hope from a direction that we might not expect. And we might also learn in those hard moments that we need to redirect our focus. The lesson this week focuses on two case studies that demonstrate the value of persistence in the journey from hopelessness to hopefulness. Two case studies, you might ask, now, that's not because Brother Layton was limited to only 13 chapters in his book. And it's not because I only agreed to teach for seven weeks. Now, it's because these two events work together to tell a story. And one of the great things about Scripture, one of the things I particularly appreciate about Scripture, is that it all comes from a single capital A author. So the themes are always going to be consistent. Even when we see events in Scripture that seem to be unrelated, it can be obvious on reflection and study that events can work together to give us a full picture to help fully equip us for life and godliness. So for today's two for the price of one lesson, we'll start with an event that involves a man lowered through a hole in the roof so he could be healed by Jesus. The second event involves a man beside a pool of water who was unable to get help for a hoped-for healing. We'll review these two events, looking at similarities and differences in their situations, and we'll examine what we can learn from them to inform our ongoing and persistent journey to hopefulness. <clears throat> so I've said persistence or persistent a couple of times already. Persistence means to continue an effort for a long time that's longer than the usual amount of time. But it's more than maybe just checking the mailbox five or six times, which is more than the usual number of attempts, before giving up for the day. It's more like checking the mailbox every afternoon and every evening for a year, waiting for a letter from an old friend. Persistence is also seen as a quality that allows us to continue to do something or trying to do something even though it's difficult or even if it's opposed by others. 
Uh, in your Bible translation, and uh, some Bible translations, persistence can be translated steadfastness. It's a similar concept. And this word, steadfastness, means to continue doing something despite difficulties or delays in achieving success. So with that context in mind, let's start our scripture reading this morning. There are three accounts of the man lowered through the roof. You can find it in Mark 9, 1 through 8. I'm sorry, Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Mark 2, 1 through 12. Or Luke 5, 17 through 26. I have chosen to read from the book of Mark because that's my first name. So the... You, if you were to, to read along in any of the other versions or, or the other uh, accounts, very similar. Not much difference between the two. So I'm reading Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. And I'm reading from the old New International Version. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he'd come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the man, um, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins... He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Jesus spent a whole lot of time in his ministry in the region of Galilee, uh, teaching there and healing as well. He chose the village of Capernaum as sort of a base camp, at least that's kind of how I feel about it. He would travel out from there and then come back and then head off in another direction and come back. And so it was kind of a central area for him. Early in his ministry, even before he had appointed his apostles, he was in this, in this event teaching at a home there in Capernaum. And the house wasn't large, which is in keeping with the construction material and income available to most folks. It was probably just a couple of rooms with a flat roof made of poles and then covered with clay tiles on top of it. And it was common for people to sleep on the roof at night to escape the the heat that was trapped in the house. In the event we're looking at today, like lots of other events, people from the area where Jesus was, wherever he went, people would crowd around and gather to hear Jesus teach. And maybe there were mixed motives, as I've talked about before, even this early in Jesus' ministry among the people who were listening. And we know that some in the crowd were Jewish teachers and leaders, and for sure that was a mixed bag of folks, different motives there. Now, some of the people who were there came to Jesus that day to be healed. And for them, not a mixed bag at all. They knew their objective. They knew what they wanted to get from Jesus, and they believed that they could get it from him. But regardless of motivation... Scripture tells us the people crowded into the room where Jesus was until it was full, and more gathered near any opening where they might hear Jesus talk, or they might be able to get a chance to sneak in as folks stepped out. Then four men show up, carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They hoped to get to Jesus so their friend would be healed. They couldn't make it through the crowd, so they went up on the roof, made a hole in the roof, lowered their friend down into the room where Jesus was teaching. All right. Can we put a pin in the story here? Just put a pin in it and think a little bit about human nature. Just a little. Now, the Bible doesn't record much. Even though we've got three different accounts in the Gospels, the Bible doesn't record much about the friends of the paralyzed man. But I think this would make a great sitcom episode. That's what I think about this. Now, now, can you imagine a scene opening up with four friends the previous day? All right, They're putting their heads together, making a plan. 
So um, we'll, say, we'll say Elmer is leading the group. Now, Elmer says, we're going to get up early. We're going to meet at Jim Bob's house at O'Dark 30. We're going to pick up Jethro on his mat at dawn, and we'll get to where Jesus is all before the crowds show up. Now, Billy Bob Skeeter, y'all don't be late. Now, in this story, I have changed all the names to protect the guilty. Uh, of course, Jesus isn't guilty of anything, so I didn't change his name. So his name is still Jesus in there. <clears throat> anyway, now the next scene, that was the first scene. Now the next scene is Elmer. Remember, Elmer's the guy who was given the instructions. Elmer's over at Jim Bob's house as the sun comes up. But, you know, where's, where's Billy Bob? Where's Skeeter? We don't know. And then you get a quick cut over to Billy Bob and Skeeter. They're brothers, by the way, for, this, for my sitcom. And, and they're snoozing. They're still snoring over in their beds. That's the second clip. Now, the next scene in this sitcom shows Elmer fussing at Billy Bob and Skeeter as they carry Jethro through the busy morning bustle of the little town of Capernaum. You can just see it, Elmer fussing at him. And just as predicted by Elmer, they get to the house where Jesus is teaching, and the crowd has already blocked their way to the door. So they put the mat down, and Elmer keeps fussing, but Skeeter's not paying any attention. He's kind of just kind of looking around, you know, like Skeeter does. And he sees a couple of birds perched up on a roof nearby. And a light bulb appears over his head. Now, it might not be a light bulb. It might have been an oil lamp. I don't know what they would have done back in those days, but something to show that Skeeter's got an idea. <laughs> and so Skeeter's been inspired, and he whispers it to Jim Bob. While Elmer continues to chew Billy Bob up one side and down the other, Skeeter and Jim Bob whisper this idea to Jethro, who's almost been forgotten down there on the mat, and Jethro signals his approval with all the enthusiasm that his paralyzed body can display. Now, the next part of the sitcom is about five minutes of Pratt Falls and comedic relief as you see these four guys figuring out how to get the, the paralyzed man up on the roof. But there they go. They're up on the roof, and now Elmer says, Now what, genius? What are you going to do with these roof tiles? No, no, what are you doing with those roof tiles? And then Skeeter says, Stop asking silly questions and get to work. And then, you know what happens next. You cut inside the house, and y'all have all seen it, where a little dust Start sifting down through the air, you know, and then a crack appears, and then a little bit more stuff falls down, and people are looking around to say, what's going on? And the people in the crowd are confused, and then maybe some are angry, some are amused, maybe depending on how much junk is landing on them, how much dirt lands on their head, you know, and they don't know what's going on. But Jesus, Jesus here is an island of calm in a sea of confusion. That's how I see it. Now, it's maybe not a sea of confusion, it's a small room, so maybe it's a pond of confusion or a mud puddle of confusion. It's a small place. But anyway, everything changes as the mat is lowered down into the crowd. Now, I see it this way. I see committed arms handing a mat down, and I see eager arms reaching up from the crowd. Now, when I was a kid, this is how it was depicted. You know, we would do the yarn and, you know, put the yarn thing and then pull the thing up. I, I don't read that they used rope in Scripture. I, for me, it's, it's arms. It's loving arms. It's human touch. That's what I see in my version of this. And this isn't a sitcom anymore. This changes from being a sitcom to being high drama. Now, the Bible account doesn't include any of those details. It's just the facts, like Joe Friday used to say on Dragnet, just the facts. The friends here almost certainly were not named Elmer and Jim Bob and Billy Bob and Skeeter. Almost certainly were not their names. <clears throat> they realize they can't make it through the crowd. They go up on the roof. They lower the paralyzed man down. The paralyzed man is almost certainly not named Jethro. But there he is, lowered down into the room where Jesus was teaching. Jesus saw the faith of the group of men, and he told the paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven. Great story dramatic story but it, what happens next makes it high drama in my opinion the pharisees and the teachers of the law who were here didn't react with joy that this man's sins were forgiven instead they were thinking that jesus had just committed blasphemy because jesus claimed to do something that only god could do and that is to forgive sins obviously in this passage they didn't believe Jesus' claims about himself. Because Jesus had already claimed to be Emmanuel, that is, God with us. 
Scripture tells us that Jesus miraculously knew the thoughts of these men. And so he answered their unspoken questions and claimed divine authority to forgive sins as the Son of Man. Now that that phrase, Son of Man, this expression was known to the teachers of the law. And Jesus used it deliberately to show his direct connection to God the Father. And then Jesus healed the man of his paralysis right there in front of everyone. And he said why he did it. He did it to prove his authority. He did it to prove that he was the Son of Man. Now, as a result of this healing, the healed man glorified God. The folks in the crowd glorified God. And I don't see an exception in Matthew, Mark, or Luke that says these folks who were doubters... The Jews who were there thinking these things in their heart, I don't see any indication that they were accepted. It says everyone glorified God. Now, that's how I read it. Others might read it a little differently. But to me, the healed man and everybody who was there who saw this immediate healing of this paralyzed man glorified God and went around talking about the miracle that they had just seen. Now, this is a story about a journey to hope. And this first case study for today, we're doing two today. In this this particular man's journey to hope, we don't clearly see hope sparked, which is that first part. Now, we, we can infer it because he knew or maybe his friends knew that Jesus could heal or they thought he could heal. And that spark of hope was enough to inspire these folks taking a chance and a big chance to dig a hole in the roof. But we do see hope sensed as the man is lowered into the room before Jesus because Jesus doesn't rebuke this action. He doesn't rebuke him for tearing a hole in the roof. Jesus instead receives the paralytic. And he receives the man based on demonstrated faith. Jesus saw faith. He recognized faith. He responded to faith. Jesus sees faith, recognizes faith, and responds to faith, no matter how small it seems or how big it seems. And then hope seen is demonstrated as Jesus heals the man, first of his sins and then of his paralysis. And Jesus shows a priority in this case by healing the man of his sin first. Now, this probably was not what the paralyzed man was there for. It's not what he was seeking. It's not what he expected. It's probably not what his friends were seeking or what they expected. But Jesus knows what's needed. And upon reflection, the healed man probably realized that forgiveness of his sins was truly hope seen because it's hope for eternity. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Jesus used this event as a teachable moment for the Jewish leaders, and for the others who are witnessing this event. After answering the challenges to his authority to forgive sins, Jesus heals the man's paralysis and completes the man's journey to hopefulness. Now, I'd like to think that all five of the guys, the formerly paralyzed man and his four friends, (laughs) became disciples of Jesus and followed Jesus around, and and who knows what they did after that. Let's make a deal. Let's go to heaven and find out. All right? All right, let's change gears. We got in this passage uh, that I just read from Mark an example of an event that's recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels, but not in the book of John. And so we're going to switch over to the book of John to an event that is recorded only there. And uh, I'll read John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. John 5, 1 through 15. In my, um, I got a little heading over it that says the healing at the pool. This is the pool called Bethesda. And I'm going to go ahead and read the 15 verses there. So you get the, the miracle that's similar to this one. It's a paralyzed man being healed. And then you get the, <clears throat> the aftermath of it. Uh, and I want to, want to include both of those. All right, so here we are. John 5, okay. <clears throat> Sometime later. Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. 
Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Recovering from a serious illness or a serious injury can take a lot of waiting. We wait for test results. We wait until our next appointment for ongoing therapy or rehab. We wait for our bodies to recover. And we wait and we wait. Some illnesses, some injuries may take years until the body recovers. Other injuries or illnesses can have lifelong consequences. That is, we continue living with the consequences of these illness or injuries, and we just have to learn to deal with it. We have to learn to adapt as we continue living. Imagine having to wait 38 years, 38 years, without hope for recovery. This man had been paralyzed for all those years and seemed to have no real hope of being healed. Now, this is, to me, even more remarkable because the normal lifespan for a healthy person at that time was 35 to 40 years. That's as long as folks in that day lived in general. This man had been paralyzed for a lifetime. Now, the day that we read about in John's gospel began like so many for this man, but it would end so differently. His nearly hopeless situation would turn to joy. Now, we can see the scene. Scripture does such a good job of putting us in place. And the scene is a bunch of blind, lame, and paralyzed people, a great number of invalids here in this public place with shade and water. Now, if you spent time around homeless camps, like I did during my year commuting along Venice Beach in California, you are probably in the right frame of mind or frame of nose may be more appropriate to say. This is not an antiseptic medical ward here. Now, I want it to be true that this particular paralyzed man had a reserved spot, a particular place in the shade, maybe not too close to the pool because he couldn't just kind of fall in or fumble in. But anyway, he had a reserved spot, but it was a shady spot. And and every day he had family or friends who would carry him there from his comfortable home where he had state-of-the-art accessibility aids. Now, they didn't have wheelchairs back in those days, as far as I know. So he probably didn't have wheelchair ramp. He didn't have power-assisted doors. Well, all those other things that we might have today. But whatever science, technology, and medicine could offer, I hope that was available to him in his normal state in his home. And then every day, someone would bring him down, someone he loved, someone who loved him would bring him down to the pool. My educated guess, though, is that he was probably more like the crippled homeless people that I saw and smelled in California. Now, whichever the case, there he lay, waiting alongside so many others suffering from various debilitating injuries and diseases. Now, why did they wait there? Scripture tells us they believed that the water would be stirred up from time to time by an angel, they believed, And then, after the water got stirred up, the first one who got in the pool would be healed. So as Jesus walks near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, he takes note 
of this particular paralyzed man and learns that this particular paralyzed man has been paralyzed for a long time. So Jesus asks him what seems to me to be an obvious question. He asks if the man wants to be healed. So the man answers with a sense of futility that he can't get in the pool before another gets in first. Jesus looks past his frustration and tells the man to get up and pick up his mat and walk. The man immediately does so. 38 years of paralysis healed in an instant. 38 years of muscular atrophy healed in an instant. 38 years without having to balance, he now has miraculous balance. 38 years with no strength, he now has miraculous strength. 38 years of degeneration restored. He's regenerated. And he has miraculous coordination as well. He had no time to practice how to walk. You've seen little kids do this. 38 years without walking, and he's able to walk. When Jesus heals, he heals beyond anything even our modern science can do. No rehab for this guy. (laughs) He gets up. He doesn't fall down. He bends down to pick up his mat and is able to stand back up again. It's no small feat. And then he's able to walk. Coordinated. Amazing. Now, John points out in the after-miracle part that the Jewish leaders questioned the man because he was carrying his bed in violation of their Sabbath rules. The man carrying the mat explained that he did so on the authority of the man who healed him, but he didn't know who the guy was who had healed him because Jesus had melted away in the crowd. Later, Jesus finds the man at the temple and encourages him to stay away from sin so that nothing worse will happen to him. The man then informs the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who healed him. They become angry at Jesus because he's healing on the Sabbath. And even worse, he claims authority and equality with God as the Son of God. So here we see this man at the pool. And he journeys from hopelessness to hopefulness. Like the other man who was healed from paralysis, we don't necessarily see hope sparked, but we can guess how it might occur. The guy hears Jesus asking if he wants to be healed. Now, although he offers an excuse why he can't be healed, there's obviously a spark of hope that maybe if he could get into the pool first, he could be healed, even after 38 years. And then as Jesus heals him, he goes from hope sensed to hope seen. He hears the words he wanted to hear, and the sense of hope results in action that results in hope seen. That is, the the man stands and doesn't fall over. He bends to get his mat and is able to straighten up. He takes a step, and his balance and coordination are miraculously in play. This is, this is not something to look past. The way Jesus heals this man, yes, he heals him of paralysis. His legs work now. But his legs don't just work. Everything that connects his legs to his brain is connected, right? His, all the nerves are, the strength is restored. But to me, this, like the parts you don't even see are the most amazing parts. So another key part of hope seen, uh, to, get, to get back onto the path. Anyway, another part of hope seen is to tell others. Uh, about the healing. So, so yeah, he, um, he was uh, quick to go and tell, once he learned who it was, he was quick to go and tell the Jews that Jesus had healed him. But let's quickly seize on what we can learn from these two events. First, we see again that Jesus has power over the spiritual and the physical worlds. His miraculous authority proves that Jesus is equal to God, who also has power over the spiritual and physical worlds. And we know from later writings as well that these miracles are recorded, these and others, so that we can have proof of Jesus' authority. Another thing we can learn from this is Jesus' desire to heal from sin, which is just as great as his desire 
to heal from physical maladies. Jesus wanted for these men, and he wants for us today, more than just a healed physical body that will still deteriorate and die. He wants us to be healed from sin to save our souls, which will live for eternity. And this is the healing that they needed most, and it's the healing that we need most today. We individually and we communally in our society, in our world. Even as our physical bodies are wasting away, we who obey the gospel are living part of our eternal life even today. John 5, 24. Another thing that we can learn is that faith isn't always obvious to us. In many of Jesus' healings, faith is evident. Sometimes the faith was small. Other times Jesus commented on someone's big faith. This has led some people to believe that physical healing requires faith. And there are two misunderstandings, at least, that come from that. One misunderstanding is that if someone continues to suffer, they must not have enough faith. This is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible establishes faith as a prerequisite for your soul's salvation, not for physical healing. No, second, of at least two misunderstandings, is kind of related to this, though, and that's that faith earns spiritual healing. Now, this is also an insidious and erroneous belief, and it couldn't be further from the truth. There is nothing any of us can do to earn salvation. We receive the gift of salvation, which is a work done by Jesus once for all when we demonstrate our faith by obeying the gospel. Now, if you want to argue that the act of receiving is a work, then welcome to my legalistic upbringing, and I hope you get the help that I did in escaping this empty but well-intentioned false doctrine. No, we come to Jesus in obedient faith. Jesus keeps his promise to give us what we need most. Death to sin, because the death is required, and resurrection to walk in a new life. <clears throat> Here's another thing we can learn, and it's a hard truth. God may not choose to heal me of my physical infirmities. Jesus did heal all ten lepers, like we talked about in one of the early case studies. But John records that he healed only one invalid from this large group at the pool called Bethesda. So do we think that Jesus had run out of divine power for the day? That he somehow didn't have enough juice left to heal them all? Of course we don't think that. Why just one? I would propose that God is sovereign God's sovereignty isn't a concept that we don't think about much because we don't think about sovereignty much. But over millennia, people have easily understood sovereignty during the long ages of kings and emperors, sultans and caliphs and khans and modern-day dictators. God is sovereign. God is free to choose whatever he wills for us. And in Christ, we are promised it's all good. It's all good. And in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, we're to glorify God. This is a fallen world, and bad things happen to good people. But remember, not a single one of us is truly good. Each one of us, even raised in the church, there every time the doors were open, Sunday morning, Bible class teacher, ones of us, deserve death because we rebelled against our Creator. God may grant physical healing, but even that's a temporary slowdown in the processes of this fallen world. Unless the Lord returns before that date, we will all have a date with death. So when God grants healing, we must praise Him and use whatever's been restored to serve Him. And when God answers prayers for healings in other ways, then we must still glorify Him and serve Him with whatever remains. So imagine these two men. If they could be here with us today, my guess is they'd love to sing a particular verse in the hymn, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. Now, in my opinion, they would probably hope the song leader would say, let us stand and sing the song. That's what I think they would want that. Um, and as they both stood tall on legs healed by Jesus, physical strength given by Jesus, 
physical atrophy reversed by Jesus, balance and coordination given by Jesus, they would hit verse 2 with full enthusiasm and full voice, and they'd say, every step is getting brighter as the golden stairs I climb. Every burden's getting lighter. Every silver, every cloud is silver lined. There the sun's always shining. No tear will dim the eye at the ending of the rainbow where the mountains touch the sky. It's my hope, and I join Brother Layton in hope, that this quarter has blessed you as we've studied hope together.